Tonight, it's my privilege to introduce our first preacher for the conference. Uh, he's not a stranger to Brackenhurst Baptist Church, Phil Hunt. I think I met Phil about a, a dozen years ago, maybe longer, and uh, just uh, immediately had great affection for this brother. He uh, came to Kitwe from the uh, United States as a missionary, I think about 20 years ago. And the Lord used him to establish Faith Baptist Church in uh, Riverside. And uh, since then, uh, they've established the Central Africa Bible College. Um, Ken Mbugwa, who's going to preach our missions conference next year, was trained by Phil at that college. And uh, since then, um, Phil has, uh, the Lord's used Phil to plant Kitwe Church. I was saying to someone at dinner this evening that Phil Hunt's one of those guys who can almost start a church by accident. Um, Phil just is a very uh, evangelistic, a gifted brother, and the Lord used him in a wonderful way. And so, Phil, you come and bring God's word to us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's a great privilege to be able to be here. Um, about four and a half years ago, um, with the blessing of Faith Baptist Church, uh, we launched out, a couple of us launched out to start um, a Bible study, an evangelistic Bible study, apologetics-based Bible study uh, in Kitwe. And we just kind of did it quietly uh, because we have a number of really good churches in our city. And so we didn't want to... Um, we don't want to disturb anybody else and what was going on, but we felt that there were just people in our city that just not being reached the gospel. And um, so that went on for a couple of years, and the Lord uh, over time blessed that, uh, that Bible study. Uh, we'd have seven or eight people show up on a Sunday, and, and uh, that kind of went to 20, and then it went to 30. And, and um, it, was, it was interesting because... You know, you're, you're sharing the word and you're teaching and you're, you're confronting people with the gospel and, and on the surface it appears that nothing is happening. I mean, hard people. People walk in and say, yeah, yeah, I'm, I want you to know I came today, but I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God. And uh, I said, you're perfect. You're just, the, you're just the kind of person that this Bible study is for, so welcome. You know, and, um, and, and it took about, I think it was about 18 months before we saw... Uh, the first uh, profession of faith, and then as though a little trickle in the in the wall of the of the reservoir, the trickle continued to drip, and someone else came to know Christ, and um, and someone else, and then someone else, and now um, by God's grace, we're seeing people who have been under the sound of the gospel for two, three, sometimes even four years. Uh, God working by his grace the power of the gospel to see them come to know Jesus Christ their Savior. So, some people in our city who uh, have come to Christ who are very well known um, and, and kind of the reaction is oh that person no 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 never not that person we know that person and yet God just by his divine grace has chosen to to call some of these people to saving grace and and uh, two, two years ago, about two years ago, two and a half years ago, uh, we formally organized uh, as Kitwe Church. And uh, so we're a baby, we're a baby church and uh, seeking to grow and honor the Lord um, through the, the proclamation of the gospel and the making of disciples. And, um, and so it's a joy to be a part of Soul of Five. We joined, our church joined last year and uh, we're just excited. I read that, that pop-up banner and I read the paragraphs down there at the bottom and that, that's exciting. That's what drew us um, to, to want to come alongside. So praise God for the 14 years. I have no idea what happened in the first 13 of those, but uh, for the past year we praise God for what he's doing and that we can come and learn from you and, and be part of, of what God is doing. And we are committed uh, to partnership for the planting of churches and the advance of the gospel of Jesus Christ because he is worthy. Amen? Um, before we turn in our Bibles, uh, let me just mention, there, there, we brought some theological journals with us. They're over there on the table. After the service, please go by and take one for as long as they last. Take your Bibles, please, and turn with me to the book of Acts. I want us to begin in Acts chapter 13. 
to kind of set the, the, the structure or set a picture in our mind for what we want to look at in Acts chapter 14, verse 21, 22, and 23. Partnered to plant. I want to speak to you this evening on this subject, a biblical commitment to plant healthy reproducing churches. And it is very unlikely that I am going to say anything to you this evening that in one way or another you have not already heard. And I believe by the very, by the very flow of the ethos of Sola Five that not only have you heard but doubtless at some, to some degree you are in fact committed to. And that gives me great joy and great encouragement as I open God's Word. But I want us to I want us to just think this evening about God's plan, His plan and His method, if you will, for the advance of the gospel, and that we would commit to the establishing of healthy, reproducing churches, if we are not already, or that we would recommit ourselves this evening to this task. According to the Joshua Project, their statistics for our continent of Africa, they tell us that there are 987, 987 unreached people groups on our continent. That represents approximately 380 million people who are living on on our continent, the continent of Africa, who have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there are not enough born-again believers in that people group to advance the gospel and there are no healthy reproducing churches amongst these people groups. The reality is that global missions is tragically neglected. The sheer number of unreached peoples on our continent is an indictment on us and upon our churches. The failure of our churches, let me say it negatively and then I will say it positively. The failure of our churches to aggressively advance the gospel of Jesus Christ through gospel proclamation, discipleship, and the planting of healthy churches is at its very core a failure of the pulpit. Let me say it positively. The responsibility for our churches to aggressively advance the gospel of Jesus Christ through gospel proclamation, discipleship, and the planting of healthy churches is at its very core a responsibility of the pulpit. Africa is not evangelized because the pulpits in Africa are not healthy in many cases. And those of us who proclaim the true gospel of Jesus Christ, a biblical gospel, for whatever reason, we're, we're, we're too involved in looking at the gears and the machinery of, of our organizations and, and we're so cumbered down with the difficulties and the problems in our own little orb that, that we rarely, if ever, look out. This is seen in the way we budget this is seen in the excuses that we make in our local churches for why we can't support our pastors or why we can't do missions. Don't tell the Apostle Paul or the Apostle Peter those kinds of things. <laughs> David Platt wrote that local churches exist to display God's glory to the nations. It is the responsibility and privilege of pastors to feel the weight of the nations and to fan a flame for the global glory of God in every local church. End of quote. Why does the church exist? This is a legitimate question. This is a question that must be answered. And though this evening many of us may be able to quickly parrot the correct answer, the, the theological answer as to why the churches exist, what does it look like practically 
It's one thing to say that we believe something, that we are committed to something, that it, it, it exists at the very core of what we value, but what, what we truly value is demonstrated by what we say, by the decisions that we make, by the actions that we take. And I would submit to you and suggest this evening that the church exists for mission. To carry out the mission given to her by Jesus Christ himself. The church does not exist for itself. This is the sad reality of many churches today. They begin after perhaps a great beginning and a few years of history. They begin to exist for the sake of existing. They have lost their focus. They have forgotten their mission. And I'm very grateful for the emphasis that I have heard already today on revitalization. Why is revitalization so important? Because it is very often and very easy for a church to still proclaim even the true gospel of Jesus Christ and yet completely go off course and lose their mission. Too often our churches have turned inward instead of courageously advancing the cause of Jesus Christ among men. The church does not exist for itself. This reality runs head on into the self-indulgent, ego-driven, psychobabble mentality that dominates many evangelical churches today. There is a preoccupation in our generation with the felt needs of people. And I, again, I am so grateful that Sola 5 takes a statement, a very strong stand on this very issue. It is needed. There are many needs. There are many needs in our world. There are many tasks that born-again believers ought to be engaged in. There are many needs, both felt and genuine, but the church needs to be preoccupied with the commission of Jesus Christ and make that command their priority. This mission of the church has everything to do with penetrating the world around us. We are salt, light, an army, ambassadors, and pilgrims. And all of these metaphors suggest movement and penetration. For the sake of our discussion in the Word tonight, I will use the term missions and church planting synonymously because I believe that in large part they are. The mission of God if we were to define God's mission, it is the work of God in reconciling sinful human beings to himself. This mission is rooted in God's desire to reconcile sinful humanity to himself. God is the power behind the mission. God demonstrates his sovereignty in his mission. He will accomplish his mission. God is the source of this mission. And that simply means that the mission that God has given to the church is His mission. He has entrusted it to us. Therefore, we have no right to redefine it. We have no right to add to it. And we have no right to take away from it. We have no right to redefine it. The church belongs to Jesus Christ. He is the founder of the church. He is the foundation of the church. He is the owner of the church. He is the head of the church. And he is the church who, he is the, he is the owner of the church who commissions the church to go on mission for him. Missions is the means by which we engage in worship of God that results in his exaltation. So the mission, as we talk about this in our text, we are speaking of the work that God is doing in reconciling sinful human beings to himself. When we talk about missions, we are speaking of the plan of committed believers of local churches to accomplish the mission of God. God's mission is the theological anchor of missions. <coughs> Missions is the practical implementation of the mission of God. 
And because this mission flows from God, it flows from the character and nature of God, therefore his mission cannot be ignored by the church. We do not have the luxury to say we will go on mission for God, we will be involved in his mission at, at some future stage. Since the mission is of God, he will equip his people for the task. He will. Throughout through the context of the local church and as, 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 we, as we teach and as we proclaim the gospel and as, as, we, as we ground men and women in the faith, God will equip people for his task. This mission is the mission of God. It implies sacrifice. This mission is worth dying for. And this mission will succeed because it is God's mission. Notice, please, if you would, in Acts chapter 13, there's another term that we throw around often. We talk about our church sending a missionary church planter. That word term missionary literally means a sent one. Someone who's been called by God to go as his ambassador with the message of reconciliation. Notice Acts chapter 13. That's what's taking place here. Now there were, Acts 13, 1. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, who's also called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, a long, lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, who we know later became, name was changed to Paul, the Apostle Paul. Verse 2, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, while they were serving the Lord, while they were ministering to the Lord, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Just a couple of, couple of notations here in this text. Notice that, that these prophets and teachers are the product of a discipling ministry. There were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers. Five men are listed. Now we know that, that the Jerusalem church sent Barnabas when they, when they heard about this, this outbreak of the gospel and this, these new Christians over here in Antioch. We know that the church of Jerusalem sent Barnabas over to, to encourage them and to, to assist them and to, and to teach them. In Acts chapter 11, we find that Barnabas, when he arrives, he saw, sees the grace of God. In verse 23, he was glad and exhorted them to remain faithful in the Lord with a steadfast purpose. And, and um, many more people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas goes to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he finds him, he brings him back to Antioch. And for a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. In fact, it was in Antioch, it says in verse 26, that disciples... So, so impactful was the gospel in their, in their lives and therefore in their community and in their culture that it was actually in Antioch that the disciples were first called Christ followers or Christians. So, so we know that Barnabas came from Jerusalem and Barnabas went and, and got Saul and brought him in from Tarsus. But I think it is right to assume that Simeon and Lucius and, and Manian this lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, are the products of, of, the, of the discipleship ministry that's taking place in this local church. So you have the prophets. Notice their preoccupation. What are they doing? They are, they are worshiping or they are ministering to the Lord. In the context of the local church, they're, they're, they're involved at Antioch. They're, they're serving the Lord. They're, they're being discipled. They're being trained. They're, they're involving themselves in the, in the teaching and the preaching ministry of the local church. Their, their preoccupation, they're ministering to the Lord. And, and into this local church, the Holy Spirit comes now and he says to the church, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. Here in verse 2 and 3 you have the placement. 
God calls out of this group of elders or this group of teachers uh, in this local church. God comes into that situation and makes it very clear to the leadership of the church and to the men who are involved that God is setting aside two of their very own and, and wants the local church to separate them, to, to send them to the work that God has called them to do. And so they fast and pray in verse 3. They commission them, they lay their hands on them, and they are sent off by the local church. Notice verse 4. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived in Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God. So they, they're sent by the church for a specific God-ordained task. They are under the authority and the accountability of Christ and his church. And they sail forth and they get to their first destination. And as soon as they step off the ship, what are they doing? They're proclaiming the word of God. Now, if we, we're not going to take time for this, but if you were to read the rest of chapter 13 and, and uh, across into chapter 14, you find that there's a list of, kind of a historical narrative of, of, of where these two sent ones went. They, they, they sail uh, on to Cyprus and then um, down to Salamis and they're preaching the word in, in chapter 13 and, and beginning in verse 13. They then travel to Antioch and Pisidia. Again, they enter into the synagogue and they begin to proclaim the gospel. They begin to preach um, and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ, and, and you move on through to chapter 14. They, they leave Antioch of Pisidia, they travel to Iconium, and they remain a long time there, um, speaking boldly for the Lord, bearing witness of, to the word of His grace. Then from there, in verse number 8 of chapter 14, they, they travel to Lystra, the city of Lystra. And when they arrive there, they heal a crippled man, and, and the people, that was the city where, where they, they said the gods have come down to us and they tried to sacrifice to them and, and, and they re barely restrained the people from doing that. And then the Jews who had been stirring up trouble and, and persecution against the gospel arrive in, in Lystra and stir up the crowds and it was in Lystra that, that Paul was stoned to death. Whether he died or, he, or not is... We, we are not sure, but they thought he was dead. They, 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 they grab him and they stone him and, and, and they drag him outside the city and, and they throw him on the refuse heap. This would be the place most likely where, where they would cast the dead animals and, and the garbage from the city and they, they, they throw Paul up on that garbage heap and, and turn around and, and walk back in and the disciples are all gathered around and they're mourning his death. All of a sudden, Paul kind of just shakes himself a little bit and and sits up. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I've probably been running right about then. <laughs> Paul sits up, and 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 you know, it, the, the amazing thing in the in the text is is that it, if that had been me, if I had survived a stoning, um, I think I would have sat up, got up, and headed somewhere else. But it says that Paul gets up and goes back into the city, and he exhorts the brethren that evening. And the next day, he travels again, and he, he reaches Derby. And that really brings us to the, to the three verses I want to point our attention to in the remainder of our time together. Look at verse 21. So, so it says in verse 20, When the disciples gathered around him, he rose up, entered the city, and on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derby. Now notice what Paul does. Paul and Barnabas arrive in the city of Derby, and they do the same thing that they have been doing in every city that they have come to. Notice what they do. Verse 21, And when they had preached the gospel to that city, and had made many disciples, they returned then to Lystra, to Iconium, Pisidia, and, uh, to, to Iconium and to Antioch of Pisidia. Verse 21. Verse 22, strengthening the souls of the disciples and encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Look at verse 23, and when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. I would suggest to you that in these three verses we have the three 
pillars, if you would, of, of church planting or, or missions. We have the basis, the foundational basis of, of what it takes to, to establish healthy, reproducing local churches. Notice these three things, if you would. Verse 21, a biblical commitment to plant healthy, reproducing churches. Look at verse 21 again. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples. A biblical commitment to plant healthy, reproducing churches is a commitment to proclaim or preach the gospel. I believe that our, that our first major failure is in this area. I'm not saying we're not preaching the gospel from the, from the pulpit on Sunday. That's, that's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about a congregation full of people who see it as their, as their mandate to proclaim the gospel everywhere they go in their circle of influence. I believe this is our first major failure, and it is in this area. We are failing to make disciples because we are failing in our apostolic passion for the proclamation of the gospel to the lost. Bill Hall in his book, Jesus Christ, Disciple Maker, wrote this. The bottom line of all ministry is the salvation of the soul. Even dedicated disciples sometimes drift from the center on this issue. It is easy to get excited about those who are being established, equipping laborers who arise, and the leaders who emerge from our works. But we must never forget that the primary goal for ministry is the salvation of people. If discipleship does not include evangelism, it doesn't deserve the name discipleship. End of quote. C.H. Spurgeon in his book published in 1859 entitled The Soul Winner wrote this. As Rachel cried, give me children or I die. So may none of you be content to be barren in the household of God. Cry and sigh until you have snatched some brand from the burning and have brought at least one sinner to Jesus Christ. End of quote. Later, C.H. Spurgeon would write this, I long to hear my brethren and my sisters universally saying, we are full of anguish. We are in agony until souls be saved. End of quote. You see, beloved, God's glory demands evangelism. He deserves to be worshipped by everyone in spirit and in truth. Look, at me, look with me, if you would, at Romans chapter 15, verse, beginning in verse number 8. God's glory demands evangelism. Paul writing to the Romans says, For I tell you that Christ, verse 8, became a servant to the circumcised, God's people, the Hebrews, to show the, God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promise given to the patriarchs. So Christ came and, and, and uh, was incarnate, and one of the things that, that Christ accomplished was to show to God's own people, Israel, the faithfulness of God. And to confirm the promises that had been made through Abraham and, and Isaac and Jacob. And through the prophets in the Old Testament, all who pointed to this, this coming one. Notice, notice the second thing that's accomplished, verse 9. And Jesus Christ became this servant in order that the Gentiles, look at this, might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written. Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again it is said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, and in him the Gentiles hope. Malachi wrote it this way, but my name is honored by people of other nations from morning until night. All around the world they offer sweet incense and pure offerings in honor of my name, for my name is great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. Psalm 50 verse 1, the mighty God, the Lord has spoken. He has summoned all humanity from east to west. Psalm 113.3, everywhere from east to west, 
praise the name of the Lord. Isaiah 59, 19. Then at last they will respect and glorify the name of the Lord throughout the world. For he will come like a flood tide driven by the breath of the Lord. Psalm 22, 28. For the Lord is king. He rules all the nations. Psalm 22, 29. Let the rich of the earth feast and worship. Let all mortals, those born to die, bow down in his presence. Psalm 22:30. future generations will also serve him. Our children will hear about the wonders of the Lord. Psalm 67, 2, may your ways be known throughout the earth, your saving power among people everywhere. Beloved, if we do not have a, a biblical commitment to plant healthy reproducing churches, we, we fail in this commitment when we fail in our commitment to preach the gospel. God's glory demands evangelization. Evangelism actualizes the redemptive purposes of God on earth. God's eternal plan of redemption through the shed blood of Jesus Christ began to be revealed in the Garden of Eden. In verse chapter 3 and verse 15 and, 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 and when he says, and your offspring and her offspring will be enemies, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. This eternal plan of redemption beginning to be unfolded in the Garden of Eden becomes a reality on a hill called Calvary. Revelation 5.9, we see a glimpse into the throne room of God. And there they are singing a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain, and you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You see, God's redemption of sinful man demands man's response of faith to the gospel. Thus, how shall they believe on him in whom they have not heard? Romans 10, 12, there is no distinction between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all who will call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But not, they have not all obeyed the gospel. Not everyone's going to respond to this gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Evangelism is also the vehicle for obedience to God who commanded us to preach the gospel to every person. Mark 16, 15, Jesus comes to the disciples and tells them to go into all the world and preach the gospel to everyone. 1 Corinthians 9, 16, Paul says, For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. Fourthly, evangelism is God's ordained plan by which he calls many sons to glory. Hebrews 2.10, it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. To the Corinthians, Paul writes in chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, verse 21, for since in the wisdom of God the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. The Jews request a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But look at this. Here's our motivation for evangelization. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Fifthly, evangelism. The reason that we must evangelize is God's compassion demands it. His compassion demands it. Psalm 86, 15, But you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. 
Remember Jesus in his earthly ministry as, as he's had a long day of, of, of preaching and teaching the people and, 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 and they hear a roar. They hear, they hear noise over the, over the top of the hill and they, look up their eye, they, they lift up their eyes and, and there coming over the crest of the, of, the, of the hill comes a multitude of people moving towards Jesus. And it says, and when he saw the multitudes... He was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. I watch these, these photos from earlier today and, and even now and you, you, you do this map thing and, and, and you look at these areas and you start hearing numbers like 80,000 or 100,000 and no gospel preaching church. That ought to break our heart. <laughs> Because I can tell you, the compassion of Christ has not wavered. He looks upon the multitudes and he cries out. Look at them. They're weary and scattered. They're, they're decimated like sheep having no shepherd. What does he do? He turns to his disciples. There's just this little handful of people. What are they among so many? And he says to them, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Number six, my love for God requires an expression in terms of participating in what God sees as important. Why should I evangelize? Because my love for God requires an expression in terms of participating in what God sees as important. Romans 5 eight. but God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In Luke 10.27, so he answered and said, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. He would then say to his disciples in John 14, 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. And finally, I must be committed to evangelism because the eternal damnation of the lost in a literal place of torment called the lake of fire. Because of the eternal damnation of the lost in a literal place of torment called the lake of fire. I saw a great white throne, the writer John says in Revelation 20. And him who sat on it and from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And the book was opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which are written in the books. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one, according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. In what some call a parable, Luke 16, 22 through 24, it says, So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Can you hear his cry? He cries out and says, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. The only recorded prayer to a saint in all of Scripture. And it's denied. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. A biblical commitment to plant healthy reproducing churches is a commitment, number one, to evangelism. And the goal of evangelism is the passionate worship of God. The goal is not just decisions. It's not even growing numerically our church. 
Our goal is committed, fervent disciples. Go back with me, please, to our text. Because that's what we see in verse 22. We must proclaim a biblical gospel. We must recommit ourselves to biblical evangelism. It must be a hallmark of our churches. But notice verse 22. Here's the second pillar. A biblical commitment to plant healthy reproducing churches is number two, a commitment to produce disciples. Look at verse 22. They return to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. What are they doing? Verse 22. Strengthening the souls of the disciples. Number two, encouraging them to continue in the faith. And number three, saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. They're establishing disciples. They're strengthening them. They're, they're encouraging them. They're comforting them. They're teaching them. I mean, this was Christ's own commission, was it not? To go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Here it is, teaching them, training them to observe, to obey all that I've commanded, and I will be with you to the end of the age. They established these, these, these new believers, these disciples. Notice that they exhorted them. That's the word encourage. To exhort them, to encourage them to continue in the faith. Simply means to, to call alongside. He exhorts these believers, these new Christians in these pagan cities to continue in their faith. Paul would say to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4.2, preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. To Timothy also in, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, he says this in verse 2, And the things that you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust, commit these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. This is a biblical commitment to produce disciples. They established them. They exhorted them to hold fast the faithful word that they had been taught so that they may be able, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and convince those who do not believe. They were to not forsake the assembling of themselves together corporately as a body, in, as the manner of some is, but they were to come together and exhort one another and encourage one another to continue in the faith and so much the more as they were seeing the day of judgment approaching. They established the disciples. They exhorted the disciples. Notice they were saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. He was equipping these disciples. Part of discipleship is preparing these followers of Jesus to suffer. Again and again, Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Part of the discipleship motif of Jesus and the disciples and the Apostle Paul, all as part of their discipleship again and again throughout the, throughout the entire New Testament, they're preparing believers to stand courageously and suffer for their faith. Listen, beloved, there's worse things than dying. How terrible to live and realize at the end of your life that you never live for anything that, that really counted for, for eternity. What a waste of a life. They equipped them. They prepared them. The path of the Christian is a path of suffering. A biblical commitment to plant healthy reproducing churches is a commitment, number one, to biblical evangelism. Number two is to biblical discipleship. Notice the third thing in verse 23. Now remember, they, they've gone on this journey. They've been sent out by this local church and they've gone to these various cities and they proclaim the gospel and then they, they went to the next city and they proclaim the gospel and they stay a year here proclaiming the gospel and, 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 and then they get to the end of the, of the journey and now they begin to go back through the cities that they had previously ministered the gospel in. Look what it says in verse 23. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Biblical evangelism, biblical discipleship, and the planting of indigenous churches. A biblical commitment to plant healthy reproducing churches is a commitment to plant indigenous churches. 
These are churches that, that, that reflect the, 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 the place that they exist. They reflect the people who make up that church, regenerated and, and, and sanctified by the grace of God. Notice that they are appointing elders and then committing them unto the Lord. I would suggest to you that these churches were self-governing. Now, now, it's very interesting because when you come to verse number 24, it says that they appointed them elders in every church. Now, if, if, if we had read all of chapter 13 and chapter 14, we have to work backwards through the text. The last time we see the word church was actually chapter 13, verse 1, when it spoke of the church at Antioch. That was the sending church. This was, this was the church planting church. This was the church that was sending some of their own with the gospel. They sent them on a, on a mission. And that was the last time you see the word church. And so these guys are sent out of Antioch. They, they proclaim the gospel. They, they teach disciples. They proclaim the gospel. They train disciples. They, 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 they proclaim the gospel. They teach disciples. They get all the way to Derby. They're still doing the same thing. They're proclaiming the, the gospel. They're strengthening the disciples. Now, now they start to go back. And now we get this verse that says, now they appoint elders in every church. And you're like, wait a minute. Where did those churches come from? Where'd those churches come from? Because there's been no mention of church in any of those cities. All we're hearing is that these men are sent out and they're preaching a biblical gospel and they're making disciples. And they're preaching the gospel and they're making disciples. And they're preaching the gospel and they're making disciples. Now all of a sudden, they're, they're ordaining elders in every church. Where did those churches come from? And I would suggest to you this evening that a biblical gospel and biblical discipleship, the natural result of those two things happening is the formation of, of bodies of believers who have responded to that gospel, who just want to come together. They want to learn more of God's word. They, they long for fellowship with other Christians. And so they just, they just naturally want to find one another. They just want to come together. They just want to encourage each other. They just want to exhort each other. They just want to learn more. They just want to serve together and Paul and Barnabas show up and they're like you guys we, we need to put some structure to this we need to organize this you, you, you guys need proper you need proper leadership you need you need you need biblical elders and we need to we need to put this thing in order and these churches are planted they appoint elders they organize the local assembly of believers I would suggest to you the text, it would indicate to us, they committed them unto the Lord in whom they had believed, that not only were they self-governing, they had elders in every church, but they were self-supporting. I mean, Paul and Barnabas show up, they organize the church, and then we see, we're not going to look at it, but if you finish on with the text, they continued to move from city to city until they got back to Antioch. They were willing to commit these fairly new believers. I mean, some of them maybe had been saved for a year or 18 months or two years. Maybe. But they were willing to commend these believers to raise up God-ordained leadership within those churches and to commend those churches to the Lord. To the founder of the church. To the cornerstone of the church to the head of the church. They commend them up to the Lord and it says, in whom they had believed. What is the context? These people had genuine faith in Jesus Christ. They had been biblically evangelized. They had been biblically discipled. Now, they are commended unto the Lord. These men were willing to let go and trust these new congregations to the Lord. Not only were they self-governing, self-supporting, I believe they were self-propagating. You see, Paul was confident in God's work of grace in these new believers. We, we, we see a little indication of that. If you go with me, and I'm almost finished, but go with me to Romans chapter, Romans chapter 15. Look at, look at Romans 15, 14. I myself, now he's speaking to former pagans who have been saved by the grace of God. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourself are full of moral goodness, 
filled with all knowledge. You know the Word of God. And you are able to instruct one another. You see, these were healthy, these were the beginnings of healthy indigenous churches. Listen, every, every living organism, by its very nature, will reproduce itself. I mean, flowers reproduce other flowers. Trees reproduce trees. Bees reproduce bees. Every living organism, by its very nature, will reproduce itself. Provided two things are true. Number one, provided that that organism is mature enough to reproduce. Right? A baby has the potential to reproduce, but needs the maturity before that baby has, comes to maturity and has the ability to reproduce. Every living organism, by its very nature, will reproduce itself, provided, number one, that it's mature, and number two, that it's healthy. And, and, the, and the point is not, how long does it take to reproduce? Right? That's not the issue. I mean, I, you know, we, we, we'll sit out back in my, in my yard and, we, and live in the middle of the city and there's really nothing I can do about it. I mean, there are times where I just watch the rats run across the fence between myself and the neighbor's house. They have chickens on the other side. And just watch, at night, just watch these rats using it like a race course running across the top of the, the wall fence. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, mice reproduce, man. They, they can reproduce. Something like every 20 days they can have a litter. I mean, like every time you turn around, there's more of them. <laughs> Do you know it takes a mother elephant 20, she carries a baby for 22 months. Ladies, how would you like that? <laughs> and then she, she delivers a baby like 250 kgs. <laughs> 22 months. 20 days, 22 months. The point is not how long does it take for a living organism to reproduce itself. The point is that living organisms naturally reproduce themselves if they are mature and healthy. Listen, beloved, the church of Jesus Christ is not an organization and that's where we spend the majority of our time on the organization. Is it not true? Listen to our business meetings. Listen to our deacons meetings. Listen to our elders meetings. It's all about the organization. The organization. Listen. We, we need organization. But the church is a living organism. And the spirit of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit of God, lives in her church. Lives in his church. We are the bride. He is, he is the head of the church. We are not an organization. We are a living organism. And every living organism, by its very nature, will reproduce itself, provided it's mature and healthy. Do you know that if you're a born-again Christian, and you're here tonight, you're a born-again Christian, do you know that you are uh, alive in Christ? You've been given spiritual life. You're a living organism. And every living organism, by its very nature, will reproduce itself, provided it's mature and it's healthy. So let me ask you this. When was the last time God in His sovereign mercy and grace used you to carry the gospel to someone and they were gloriously converted when was the last time Christian that you intentionally opened your mouth and confronted someone in love with the truth of Jesus no for me you see me I do lifestyle evangelism 
I got news for you. Somebody can watch the way you live and you live for Jesus. They can watch the way you live for 20, 30, 40, 50 years and die and go to hell because unless the gospel is proclaimed, if they do not hear the glorious riches of God's saving grace, they will not be saved. That's the method that God has chosen. So stop trying to change it. Let me ask you this question. When was the last time you intentionally targeted older men here this, 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 this evening, you older men who are part of our local churches, when was the last time you looked out, you sought out, you prayerfully sought out and engaged a younger man in your church and you became friends with that brother and you invested your life in that brother for the sake of discipleship? I mean, I mean, literally, you just intentionally just rubbed all of your life right off onto that younger brother. When was the last time you did that? Let me ask you a question. Could you take me by the hand tonight and could you walk me somewhere in this city or in the city where you live and could you introduce me by name to someone that you are discipling? This is my Timothy. And if you can't, God help you. Because you're not on mission. Let me ask you local churches. Are you planting other churches? No, you see, we still aren't fully paying our pastor and we got this problem and we got this problem and, and we are. And how long have you been in existence? Oh, well, just, you know, only about 25 years. <laughs> There's a problem. Is it, is it maturity? Because you got the gospel wrong, you got it wrong. Or is it you're unhealthy? Listen, I, the church isn't rocket science. Church planning is not difficult. And we make it difficult. It's not difficult. It's not difficult. Because Christ said, I will build my church. I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Let me conclude. Five suggestions as you prepare your church for a church plant. There are probably many others that we will hear. I hope that we will get this week. But let me give you five that mean something to me. Number one, corporately and regularly pray for God to use your church to extend the gospel through a church plant. Do you, do, you, do you actually pray? Do you actually talk about this with your people every time you get a chance? Do you actually pray about it every week? Number two, propose and adopt a church budget in 2019 that reflects this mission priority. Now you may not be able to do this, but if you're a new church plant, here's what I'd suggest. Start with 20% of your total income. 20%. Look, people, put your money where your mouth is. Is it our priority or is it not? Our people catch it when it comes from the pulpit, when we're preaching it and we're modeling it and we're teaching it and we actually, we actually believe it. We actually believe that God is going to do this. I don't know how he's going to do it. I don't know, I don't know where he's going to do it. But I know he's going to do it because that's the reason we exist. And my church is hearing that week after week after month. It's in the, it's in the budget discussions. Number three, identify leadership and strategically and intentionally invest in them. Work towards training up the next leaders of the church. Number four, beware of placing barriers before church planners that Christ did not place there. All right, I'm going to say something before I say it. I'm the president of a Bible college and seminary. Don't place, beware of placing barriers before church planners that Christ didn't place there, such as demanding that they're a seminary graduate. Or demanding that they do things the way that the sending church does them. 
Number five, remember that church planning will often flow from within your own congregation. Be intentional and be willing to give church members a way to plant a new congregation. Talk about it. Pray. Lord, please take, take people from our congregation to plant another church. Lord, please, I don't know, whenever you're ready, but Lord, we want to be on board with you when you're ready for that. And then let me give you five suggestions for engaging in a church plan. This is very, very basic. But I mean, this is, this is what we've done in Zambia. Prayerfully target and evangelize an area, number one. Prayerfully target and evangelize. See if God is going to do a work somewhere. Number two, gather those who profess faith into a weekly home Bible study. It was a blessing to hear about that just a few minutes ago. Number three, teach, train, and disciple these new believers. This includes getting them involved in the ministry and handling appropriate responsibilities. Number four, move the Bible study to Sunday morning. And number five, formally organize the church. A problem is not that it's difficult. A problem is we really don't believe God's going to do it. Father, if we failed, forgive us. Where we failed, forgive us. I'm so encouraged to hear and see this burden shared by so many of my brothers here. Lord, would you just pour fuel on this passion? Help us to keep the main thing the main thing. Help us to abandon ourselves to your purposes and to your will and to your mission, for you deserve to be glorified by every tribe and tongue and nation and people. God, give us, give us, the church in Africa, give us these 987 people groups, give them to us, Lord. Lord, these 380 million people who live amongst peoples who have never one time heard of Jesus Christ, give us these people, Lord. Give us a thirst for you. Give us a burden for your glory amongst the nations. Help us, Lord, to recommit to readjust to do whatever it's going to take in our own location to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ and we pray this for the sake of your holy name Amen